I, I, we can do the test right now. We'll do the test on you and see if it works. So what you do, is it okay? Yeah. So what you do, there is a false stereotype that mm -hmm. people that are hypnotizable are somehow more weak-minded or more gullible. And I would say, no, that's not true. Why and do they snap their fingers? Like, what's the... Ah, ah, <laughs> very good question. So yeah, they had a client, a massive migraine, and put them into trance. Migraine was gone in, I don't know, four minutes. So hypnosis also helps you kind of deal with your inner critic, your inner chatter, uh, but it also helps in pain management, reducing anxiety, overcoming trauma. So it's almost like hacking your mental programming in a way. It's not almost like hacking your <laughs> mental program. It is hacking it your is mental hacking. <laughs> you, can, you tell somebody to do something really bad under trance, they usually just wake up. And so hypnotism and train, I'm giving away the secrets here. Albert Nirenberg is a man of many talents. He's a reporter, a filmmaker, a hypnotist, and a laughologist. He has done several TV specials and documentaries on new approaches to wellness. In this podcast, we are going to deep dive into hypnotherapy for wellness. Mind you, this is not your grandfather's hypnosis. Albert is a part of a new wave of hypnotists who uses informed, cutting-edge techniques in hypnotherapy. He has conducted several stage shows, including TED Talks across the world, which features dramatic demonstrations of hypnosis, huge laughs, and eye-opening revelations. I hope this podcast challenges your beliefs about hypnosis, and we no longer view it with a lens of fear and suspicion. In conversation with Albert, and as the hypnotists always do, enjoy. Hello, Albert. Very warm welcome and thank you for joining me today. Thank you. Great to be here. So today we're going to be uncovering this somewhat mysterious topic of hypnosis and its healing benefits. I'm very, very curious to find out if that kind of power really exists in a soothing voice and a swinging watch. So let's dive right in, Albert. I'll tell you the version of hypnosis that I'm aware of. And it's from the movies where a hypnotist uses a candle or a swinging watch to hypnotize the patient so that they can recall a particular incident and then the movie plot unfolds. So from the research that I have done, um, I know television has completely, completely skewed my understanding of hypnotherapy as an expert practitioner. If you can tell us what is hypnosis and what is the science behind it? It's a very good question, a loaded question in some ways, because I think that um, one of the problems with hypnosis is that it has been difficult to define. I, I did a TEDx recently, well, not so recently, a while back, um, called Is Hypnosis Fake? Where I think it, it, it's, a, it's interesting because that TEDx went viral, but I think the reason it went viral is it was an attempt to try to demonstrate a model for hypnosis while doing hypnosis. So the model, people have noted that when people are hypnotized, and these are deep trances, uh, people's eyes tend to flicker or to move back and forth, very similar to uh, what you would call rapid eye movement or REM state sleep. Hypnosis is a waking dream state. And if you take it a step further, it's a manageable waking dream state, meaning you can put somebody into a waking dream state, which can then be managed where you're talking to their unconscious. So the implications are huge because our unconscious is generally something we see that we have very little control over or is just driving our behavior without our knowledge. And, you know, when you actually said that the eye is rolling up, so sometimes when we're trying to recollect or focus, we automatically look up in the air as though it's written. Um, so by looking up, are we inducing alertness? Yeah, there's a lot of things going on there. What I could mention mm -hmm. to you is that there's a test called the Siegel test. And it is that so people that are more hypnotizable, literally their eyes roll up further. And I, I, we can do the test right now. We'll do the test on you and see if it works. So what you do, is that okay? Yeah. So what you do with somebody is you take, you take your finger, you take your finger and you simply put it on the top of the middle of your head, like right here. Good. 
And now with your head steady, you try to look at your finger. You try to look as, that's right. You try to look where your finger is and you want your eyes to go up as far as possible. Let your eyes roll up. So you, are you looking at where your finger is? I am. This is the furthest I can go, Albert. Okay. So, so, so it, it, according to the Siegel test, you would be a more challenging hypnotic subject. What happens with this test is if somebody is very hypnotizable, their eyes roll up to the point where they turn entirely white. You would just see the whites of their eyes. It's okay. a very simple test. And I don't know why. There's a lot of mystery as to why this is, but... Mm -hmm. For example, I developed an induction. So I have, an, I have a hypnotic induction I call the float induction, where what you do is that even if you are not very hypnotizable, you practice floating your eyes up as much as possible. And so you aggressively, in a sense, push your eyes back. And what it seems to do is induce trance in people that are not that hypnotizable. Does it mean that um, people who are more gullible can get hypnotized easily or is it that people who aren't easily hypnotizable they have more control over their mind as well does that aspect come into play i argue this is entirely mythological so mm -hmm. so i want to answer your questions because they're really good questions so people mm -hmm. that are hypnotizable are somehow more weak-minded or more gullible and i would say no that's not true in a hypnotic state everybody is more gullible anybody who's hypnotizable <laughs> and goes into hypnosis would probably be very suggestible. That's the term we would use. So, mm -hmm. for example, if you were in a hypnotic trance and I said, the room that you're in is very hot, the weather is, you know, the temperature is very hot. If you were in trance, you'd be like, oh, my God, this room is hot. Mm -hmm. So that would appear to be gullibility. But what you're you're actually showing is suggestibility in a critical exchange, meaning if we were arguing about politics and I was to say something that is maybe outside your knowledge would a hypnotizable people person respond in a gullible way mm -hmm. and the answer is there is some research on this probably no that when people engage their critical faculties meaning we're having a critical conversation about something i uh, a hypnotizable person is no more gullible and and not only that sort of an idea that hypnotizable people might be dumber or mm. or less um, for, you know, critically minded, and that's not true either. Okay. It's sort of a, really what hypnotizable hypnotizability shows is this uh, is really just the ability to go into deep trance mm -hmm. while in an, in an alert state. Um, and and there are some interesting reasons why some people can do it and some people can't. So mm -hmm. I'll give you a weird example: people that have had trauma, people who have had extreme trauma tend to be more hypnotizable and one explanation they think is because they uh dissociated to survive the trauma so they can go back to that state mm -hmm. people with a history of extreme childhood abuse okay. tend to be more hypnotizable and artists true artists people that have strong visual imagination tend to be more hypnotizable but these are all tendencies mm -hmm. and rules yeah so basically hypnosis is like a state of calm and high focus eliminating the surround sound like this shift in consciousness it also occurs in shamanism right and in past life regression so in the shaman rituals we obtain information in the form of visuals um, visions and journeys in what form do we obtain information in hypnosis Really good question. So, yeah, there's an interesting parallel between shamanism and hypnosis where traditional shamanism, and I think we're talking about uh, as practiced often by indigenous groups, I think some in many famously in Siberia, but also throughout um, the Americas and, and also in Europe as well. But um, there the shamanism, what's different about it is that it is the shaman who generally goes into trance. So famously, you see images of shamans with their eyes mm -hmm. rolled up. Yeah, they're the they're the ones going into trance. But what's interesting about that, and so they then journey for you. So if you come to a shaman with a question, why do I have this disease or what what is happening in my life? Shaman goes into the trance and journeys for you and then maybe comes back with an answer. Now, what's interesting is that hypnotic phenomena is contagious. Mm -hmm. So if you visit a shaman who goes into trance, you may go into trance as well. 
what makes hypnosis different is that it is usually the hypnotist that facilitates mm -hmm. the trance for the subject, which is a little bit different, but it turns out that a good hypnotist is, and we're not sure exactly why this is, but a good hypnotist is really able to, de to deepen trance to a depth that it is even deeper than, let's say, a shaman. And that's because of the technology of hypnosis. We know that certain techniques can really, really deepen a trance. And, and we know that we follow the protocol and we'll get very deep. So does hypnosis tap into a more deeper level of subconscious compared to past life regression or shamanism? The mainstream tradition of hypnotherapy is fairly science or evidence based. Mm -hmm. And so we w w w here's a good way of understanding it. I, I mentioned this in a talk a while back. You know, what may, what put Sigmund Freud on the map famously was his belief that most of our thoughts, impulses, instincts are unconscious. And and to the individual that creates a mis a mystery, meaning half of what we feel think or or behave is not under our control everything from ticks to habits to behaviors to the way we sleep to to our passions and urges seem to be driven by some mysterious force mm -hmm. which is our unconscious hypnosis gives us access it gives us a kind of access to that part of us where literally sometimes we can take the unconscious and interview it I'll give you an example is that some people have very hostile voices in their heads. So you, you, this is very common. Many of us, all of us, it turns out have voices in our heads Yeah. that are telling us kind of like a committee that's telling us what to do. Yeah. And, and, but that committee is something that, that we feel like we just have no choice about. It's just there. Mm -hmm. But in hypnosis, we can take a voice and we can say, hello. I'll give you an example. I often talk to people's, either homophobic voices or their, what I would consider their homosexual panic voices. I had a young client, a teenage, a teenager, uh, who's always had a voice in his head. Whenever he looked at other men, he considered himself to be heterosexual. But uh, whenever he looked at other men, the voice would, would taunt him homophobically. He would hear it in his head. He started to think he was developing schizophrenia. So what we did is we just sort of in trance, we went and found out who that voice was. And it was just a essentially a paranoid, fearful part of himself that once he confronted, went away, he just completely went away. Um, he wasn't a homophobic person. He was a person that was relatively comfort comfortable with his sexuality. So I'm just giving that as an example of hypnosis is a way for us to confront these internal parts that normally we have no access to. Yeah. Uh, another example is anxiety. So many people have anxiety these days. Yeah. Um, and again, people experience anxiety as a kind of energy or voice that is just manipulating, controlling them. Mm -hmm. They have no control over it. Well, a hypnotist can easily help somebody um, confront or and or manage these states. Uh, so why wouldn't that be a great thing? Uh, you know, usually you can bring down people's anxiety dramatically in one session. Uh, you can help people with headaches. I Yesterday I had a client, a massive migraine, and put them into trance. Migraine was gone in, I don't know, four minutes. That's not unusual. You can get rid of headaches, migraines, and you're not using drugs. Uh, so there's some very interesting applic applications. Uh, you might say, well, why isn't it more? You just told me that, you know, I can get rid of migraines. And we know that migraines are seen as this sort of somewhat untreatable condition. Why isn't this more well known? Well, it's this weird catch. The person who came to me with a migraine was a very good hypnotic subject. So very quickly was able to go into very deep trance. And so that's why the migraine went away so fast if somebody comes to me and is not a good hypnotic subject i can't guarantee i'll be able to get rid of their migraine so fast but i'm telling you anybody who's a good hypnotic subject you should not be suffering through migraines you can you can get rid of them so 
hypnosis also helps you kind of deal with your inner critic your inner chatter uh, but it also helps in pain management reducing anxiety overcoming trauma so it's almost like hacking your mental programming in a way it's not almost like hacking <laughs> your mental program it is hacking it your is. Mental program. <laughs> yes yes but i would say in a positive way I think let us go. You know, you mentioned at the beginning that that people have a lot of fear and and anxiety around hypnosis. You know, I often hear people say, "I can't. I don't want somebody in my brain." Mm. You know, as if the hypnotist is is inside your brain. Um, I have never. You know, I've done hypnosis for a very long time. I've never ever thought I was inside somebody else's brain. It, it's just not how it works. It might be like a good way of looking at it is. You know, and, and the other thing about the concept of being somebody being inside your brain, I'm like, have you ever had what's called a conversation? <laughs> because when somebody is speaking yeah. and you're listening to their voice, their voice is inside your brain. That's so you seem to be able to tolerate that quite well. <laughs> yeah. But there, you know, there are like, um, and as you just really rightly mentioned, hypnotherapy is viewed with a lot of fear, skepticism, suspicion. So would you like to dispel some of the myths for us today? And I know that television or movies hasn't done any favors to hypnotherapy. So let me let me suggest that there's some very interesting. So why are people so afraid of hypnosis? Mm -hmm. so, so one of the reasons is in the current atmosphere, science is a factor. Science, the way the scientific method works is we want 100%, um, like, like I'll give you an example. If somebody tests a new drug, the implication is that the if they do a test with thousands of people, that the evidence would suggest that the drug has the same effect across the board. Most people are going to respond the same way because we did the test on a number of people. That's the way it works. Hypnosis is a little bit weird because, again, when you work with hypnotizable people, you get dramatic, dramatic results very, very quickly. When you work with non-hypnotizable people, it's more challenging and the results are iffier. Okay. So that creates a not a sort of not across the board effect. Mm -hmm. So that's one reason why there's some confusion because people will see, will watch a show and they'll see there's somebody, um, you know, turned into a chicken, let's say, and then they'll be like, try that on somebody else and it doesn't work. Yeah. So that's one of the problems. So originally Hollywood is probably the, the, you know, the very early Hollywood films. The famous one is called The Hypnotic Eye, mm -hmm. which was a mixture of anti-Francophobia. So the main character is a Frenchman who hypnotizes women to kill themselves. Um, so this goes against everything we know about hypnosis. Mm -hmm. Why? Because... Um, the unconscious mind, by definition, is protective. So if you bring the unconscious mind to the fore, which is what hypnotists do, and then you were to say, and now kill yourself, mm. it just wouldn't work. The person actually comes out of a trance. I'll give you a really, really funny example of this. One of the rules of hypnosis is you rarely can get people to violate their own moral code. And so this is true. If you, if you, If you tell somebody to do something really bad under trance, they usually just wake up. Okay. And this is, is this sounds, you know, kind of confusing because you'd be like, well, how do they know? Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example is that when you put people in trance, you're making them more relaxed. You're making them more comfortable. Yeah. As long as they are relaxed and comfortable, they tend to go deeper. If you introduce an idea that makes them uncomfortable and or stressed, mm -hmm. they start to come out of trance. Okay. And and that's why it's a game of keeping people relaxed to a certain extent. And so, so, so I had an experience once doing a stage hypnosis show, where it's very easy to hypnotize people who normally can't sing to sing. So they'll mm -hmm. sing because they have a loss of inhibition in trance. So I had a group of four people, and I said they're a singing group, and it was amazing to see four people who don't know each other suddenly become a four-person singing group and sing together. And they did. They sang together, made up a song on the spot, and they were quite entertaining and funny. So I decided to step it up, and I said, foolishly, uh, and now you're going to sing in Chinese, just to make it you know, more extreme. Well, as you may know, Chinese is not a language. Mandarin is a language. Yeah. Cantonese 
piece of language. And it was a very sort of insensitive and culturally ignorant suggestion on my part, which I admit, I learned my lesson. But what happened was more interesting. One of the people was not Chinese, but one person happened to have grown up partially in China, mm -hmm. had a sensitivity to Chinese culture, and suddenly broke, woke up out of trance and literally said out loud, Chinese is not a language. Oh. And then I was like, oh, you're right. And, and mm -hmm. okay, we'll move on to something else. So that was it. But it was a very clear example of this phenomenon that when you, I think they felt that this was a little bit touchy mm -hmm. and that I was violating their moral code by asking mm -hmm. them to do this thing. And so they came out of trance. And that is often the rule. Okay, so basically hypnosis is a voluntary process. You know, people can't be hypnotized against their will. Is that is that right to say? It's a difficult question. I would answer that they cannot be well hypnotized against their will. But let me give me some really good examples of hypnosis against your will. Sure. So there's a famous example of a video. I, it is a TED talk, a TEDx talk that I did called Surprise, You're Hypnotized. This is a video which is an example of somebody being hypnotized against this, their will. Uh, this is a, a fellow from Canada. He's a, quite a famous hypnotist named Spidey. Um, and he, he really wanted to show his hypnotic powers by demonstrating that he could hypnotize his way out of a traffic ticket. So what he did, and I'll just set it up. <laughs> yes, I was thinking, people are thinking are taking notes already. So, so what he did is he knew that there was a police sort of uh, ambush Behind, you know, next to a stop sign in his neighborhood. And so what he did is, very deliberately, he drove through a stop sign in front of a police car at twice the speed limit. So very much committing crime. So, or almost a crime. He did it safely. He knew there was no traffic, and he knew it was possible to do it safely. Now, what he does, and I can explain what he does in the video. So this actually applies to Switzerland. Canada is a place where we speak uh, multiple languages, just like here. It's very impressive, by the way. Um, and what he does is, the first thing he does is he asks the police officer to switch languages. In hypnosis, we call that a pattern interrupt. When you interrupt somebody's pattern that they're used to or familiar with, they are now more open to the next suggestion. After that, he snaps his fingers. When he snaps his fingers, the police officer is open to another suggestion that, have you ever gone somewhere and forgotten why you're there? And that is exactly, he seems to be talking about himself, but he's making the suggestion to the police officer. So let's see if it works. I'm sorry, do you speak English? Do you speak English? Yes, I speak English. Uh, okay, good, then you can help me. I really need to know where the closest gas station is, please. The closest gas station? Yeah. Is that why you burn the stop sign just ahead at about twice the speed limit, sir? Oh, that, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, that's fine, but you know what? If we just forget that for just a second, we'll get right back to it, but if we could just forget it, we'll get right back to it. If you could just tell me where the closest gas station is, please. The closest gas station, you just follow up there. At the end of the street, you turn right. Turn it's right. the main street. On your right, there's a Petro Canada, something like that at the right. You know, it's funny because I knew that, but it's as if I just forgot. It's like, you know, sometimes you get up and you go somewhere to do something, and it's as if you just forget the reason you're there. You don't know if you remember to forget or forget to remember. It's just as if it just slips from your mind, you know? But it's good that I found you because now I know where it is and I can go. I can just yeah. go. Yeah. Thank yeah. It's there. Oh, good. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Have a good day. Okay. Okay, bye. Bye. Don't say anything, don't, don't say anything. Don't he's, he's kind of confused. So it sounds like he's talking about himself, but when he snaps right. his finger, he's actually making the suggestion to the police officer. Yeah. Have you ever done something and then forgotten exactly why you've done it? You've done it. Meaning he's telling the police officer that he's forgotten why he's pulled him over. Yeah. So the police officer is like uh, confused, and he says, "Well, mm -hmm. well, then I guess I can just go then." And the police officer literally says, "Yes, you can just go." Wow! And he drives off without a ticket. So that is an example of, I would say, the use of hypnosis. Now, now is the hip is the police officer in a deep hypnotic trance? Not necessarily. He's in a light trance, but. 
he responded hypnotically to suggestions. Why and, do they snap their fingers? Like, what's the... Ah, ah, <laughs> very good question. So, common misunderstanding. So, in the 19th century and 20th century, the traditions of hypnosis were extremely authoritarian, meaning, but that's because we respond to authoritarian behavior. So, okay. hypnotists tended to wear dark clothes, they tended to act in an officious manner, and they tended to essentially order people into trance because it worked. Okay. It would be better, you'd be better off saying to somebody, sleep, rather than, is it okay if you sleep? Yeah. Um, modern hypnosis doesn't require that authoritarian behavior. So, yeah. so finger snapping is often seen as authoritarian behavior, meaning I order you to go to sleep, but it's it's more interesting than that. A sudden surprise, so like the sound of finger snapping, actually shocks the mind. Mm -hmm. They only get scientific about it. So there's some there's some debate about what's going on, but there's a phenomenon called the PGO spike, which is basically a reorientation reflex. So when we are surprised mm -hmm. by a loud sound, we reorient quickly, probably from the jungle where we evolved mm -hmm. to hear, uh, like snap is literally like a, if there was a tiger behind you, you might hear a branch snap, right? Mm -hmm. so you better look around. So you unconsciously reorient. And what happens is, in that moment of reorientation, the brain opens wide. It's trying to get as much information in as possible. Is there a tiger? What's going on? Mm -hmm. And so hypnotists have been trained. I'm giving away the secrets here. Hypnotists have been trained that one eighth of a second after the surprise. Okay. If you make the right suggestion the right way, the unconscious will accept it. So, mm -hmm. sleep. Can you feel it? Right. Yeah. So, so what the snapping is is not an authoritarian behavior, which is what people think it is. Like I hereby order you into trance. Yeah. It is simply a surprise which then the hypnotist uses to drop the people into trance. And is that why, you know, in your other videos as well, you probably clap or you probably tap someone's shoulder or, and you have to get the timing right, is what you're saying. So it can be anything. It doesn't okay. have to be uh, a snap. It can be any sudden, anything that is slightly surprising mm -hmm. can can induce this trance. And it's, it's a, the point is it doesn't even have to be that, that much of a shock. Um, but but yes, exactly. You're right. It's the principle, not the snap itself. Right. And and Albert, what are some clinical applications of hypnosis? I know you mentioned uh, reducing anxiety, overcoming trauma. Um, so let's say if I'm addicted to smoking, drinking, or even eating, how does hypnotherapy help me overcome these addictions? If you can just elaborate a bit more on the healing effects. Absolutely. So, so let me start. So you, you've sort of asked a big question here is like, why is hypnosis helpful? How does it help people? Yeah. So first I would say what's, what's really intriguing about hypnosis is that if you, that, that simply getting into trance is helpful people. So if you get somebody into deep trance, so the theory is that, um, let me explain why, um, when human, as we go through our days during the day, we tend to we are corroded by our days. Meaning, we have cell damage, we have uh, exhaustion, we have fatigue, we go through resources. And what's interesting is that, from what they know, there are only two true healing states. So, if you have a wound of some kind, those wounds only heal at night when you are in REM or in deep sleep. Those are the two states in which you heal. So just by getting people into the REM trance, the deep trance, I think you promote healing. Okay. That's the first thing, the healing that whatever the person needs, that, that they, they know what they need or their unconscious knows. So common uses for hypnosis are, yes, any habit that feels outside the person's conscious control, such as like an addiction. So usually famously people who drink or smoke or do drugs will tell you like, I don't want to drink or I don't mm -hmm. want to do drugs. I don't want to smoke. And so hypnosis gives us access to that behavior. I'll give you a really good example of, of why hypnosis is more effective than other methods, some other methods. Let's say somebody, you're in Ireland. So let's say somebody has a drinking problem. 
they drink a little too much. And so famously, they will start walking around going, I got to stop drinking. I got to stop drinking. Right? Now, this doesn't work. It never works. In fact, the more the person starts telling people, I got to stop drinking, the more drinking they actually do. Yeah. Because they're actually hypnotizing themselves. And I'll explain what I mean. At the simplest level, so if I was to explain the difference between the conscious and the unconscious mind, the conscious is primarily linguistic. It works with words it's, and it can handle abstraction. So, so the, the, the expression, I must stop drinking, mm -hmm. is a linguistic phrase. The unconscious mind, being ancient, primordial, millions if not billions of years old, works in pictures, sounds, it's auditory, and feelings. So when you when the unconscious mind hears the phrase, I must stop drinking, it actually just sees the picture. It just sees drinking. Mm -hmm. So every time you repeat, I must stop drinking, you actually play the movie of somebody drinking. You've just tagged mm -hmm. on the must stop part, which only the conscious mind understands. Mm -hmm. Must stop. So every time I repeat it, I'm actually driving myself to drink. So one of the first rules of hypnosis is you must create a movie or imagery that moves people in the opposite direction. So instead of saying, I must stop drinking, you would say to somebody, I must create a healthy and sober life where I drink healthy drinks. You know, there's th yeah. that. And with smoking, something similar. You don't say, I must stop smoking. You say, I would like to become a fresh air breather where I take care of my lungs and keep my lungs as healthy as possible. By creating a movie, a visual a picture that is positive, you begin to break the pattern of addiction. So let's say, you know, you hypnotize someone and you help them during that phase to, let's say, overcome drinking, overcome smoking, any any addiction that they have. What happens after that? I, I would love to give you the, the clearest, simplest answer. And the problem is that uh, is this question of hypnotizability. So a highly hypnotizable people, person will often within one or two sessions have a dramatic change. A less hypnotizable person, sometimes it takes a bit more time. But we're still talking, in terms of other methods, hypnosis is still really rapid. So, so it can it can take just a few sessions. For example, with smoking, I often do four sessions. Okay. Um, with a, with a nervous tick, it's often one session. Okay. Um, so it can happen very fast. Is there a risk risk of relapse? Y yes. Uh, but that's because addictions are just the way they are. Meaning, uh, if somebody has like like has a is an alcoholic, it's not. I would love to say one session they stop being an alcoholic. Well, mm -hmm. if that were true, everybody would be lining up at the hypnotist's office. So, yeah. But but in some cases, a few sessions with a motivated person can stop somebody from being an alcoholic. Okay. So yeah, it, it can it can be very effective. Yeah, so it's it's person to person dependent on how yeah. on how long would they actually take, and and also their motivation. We in hypnosis we say a person must be at threshold for them to make change. Meaning, mm -hmm. and this is a this is a real issue because some people who have a bad habit aren't really motivated to change their habit. They they like their habit. They don't mind it that much. This is just somebody in their life who doesn't like it. And so they go to the hypnotist and they go, can you just stop me from being an alcoholic? Well, then I know that person's not at threshold. Right. They're not ready to change. And that's a big factor in the business. No, that makes sense. So, Albert, does one really feel less pain after a few sessions if they've gone through a very deep trauma? So what happens, there's a, there's a very, there's a wonderful protocol in hypnosis, has a very long name called the Visual Kinesthetic Dissociation Protocol. And what it does is, what's interesting about it is there is now neuroscience, and I happened to cover, as a reporter, I covered some of the neuroscience around this protocol to explain how it works. And what happens is that when we have a memory, so when we remember something, uh, basically, our, the memory needs to be re-encoded back into the brain for us to re-remember it. 
And what hypnosis allows us to do, so for example, when somebody has a terrible trauma, uh, which is reoccurring, we ask in trance, we ask them to sort of go into trance. And then we ask them for the key component of the trauma. And then what we do is we mess with the actual visual tag of that memory. Let's say you were like, I had this traumatic experience doing a podcast mm. with Albert Nuremberg. And you, I would say, well, what was the image? Well, I have this image of, you know, talking to this guy with weird hair. I can't get it out of my mind. Well, you would go into trance. I would ask you to remember that particular image. And mm -hmm. if, and then if I, te I would test it first, I would say, how painful is that image? And if you said it's nine out of 10 or 10 out of 10, I'm feeling the trauma when I see that picture, then we go into trance and we change the picture. I say, now imagine that picture as a black and white image, shrink it down, throw it in the ocean or whatever. Mm -hmm. And now slowly return back to your life. What I've done is I've taken your your unconscious mind now has to re-remember that picture. When it tries to re-remember it, it cannot see it in vivid color anymore. It only sees a shrunken down black and white image. And it's suddenly discharged. Now people worry that when they go back to the original trauma, that they're like the, the hypnotist has made them forget. No, you don't forget what happened. It just stops having this massive charge that it used to have. It used to be that when you remembered your trauma, your heart started beating, your, your anxiety mm -hmm. went through the roof. Now it's just a picture or an image just like anything else. No, this, this can happen instantly, meaning it happens in you know five minutes, basically. Okay. So anybody facing anxiety, any pain, any trauma, uh, any addictions can actually try hypnosis out it's not something that is out of reach for the common people that, that's a really good way of saying yes those are all areas of hypnosis is, is shown to be quite effective the, the 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 proviso or like the addendum is provided you have a good hypnotist if the hypnotist mm -hmm. doesn't know what they're doing you might not get any results um and that's a that's a tough question hypnosis is a little mm -hmm. bit unregulated okay. because it's hard to regulate it's hard to determine who is a good hypnotist. But in the business, we tend to say it's self-regulating because the truth is people think that a hypnotist can do a lot of harm, but I actually think not so much. I'll give you an example. If I do those protocols on you and I just don't do them right, generally speaking, you will just become annoyed and feel like you got nothing done. And you will never go back to that hypnotist again. Uh, and you'll tell your friends, I went to this hypnotist and it was utterly useless. If you go and you have a healthy effect, things are resolved. You feel much better. You're happier. Then you're going to tell your friends, oh, that was a good hypnotist. That was a good experience. So yeah. that's that way is self-regulating. But there's no body or outfit that polices. Mm. And it goes from country to country. I don't sure what it is in Ireland. That's very interesting, uh, Albert. Have you ever hypnotized yourself? Are you hypnotizable? I would describe myself originally as a terrible hypnotic subject. Mm -hmm. I, when you do, um, when you take classes on how to be a hypnotist, you sit you sit across from other students, so much like this. So you would sit across from other students and and you learn inductions, hypnotic inductions. So I would, you know, first I would run the induction on you, or you would run the induction on me. And then I wrote it on you and you really find out and the other person will tell you, boy, you're either you're easy to hypnotize or you're hard to hypnotize. And generally people just say, God, you are hard to hypnotize. You're, you're not the, I was very, not a good hypnotic subject, but I've improved dramatically because I wanted to, I wanted to become good because when you learn hypnosis, it is great to be hypnotizable. Like I said, get rid of headaches, improve your states, relax, get to sleep. Mm -hmm get rid of pain. There's a whole bunch of, you know, reasons why you would want to be a good hypnotic subject. Um, so one can improve. There's some debate about how much one can improve, but I developed a bunch of inductions that are designed for people that are bad hypnotic subjects. So one of them is a float induction. Another I'm developing right now is called the blink induction. So let me explain this one. 
when people go into trance, so it might even be happening a little bit right now. I'll just see if it actually works on you, if you don't mind. So, okay. so when you start speaking to people hypnotically, what that means is basically you slow your voice down and you speak in a way that is relaxing and calming. That's right. People will begin blinking much as you are right now. That's right. Mm -hmm. And they will begin blinking in a particular way. And hypnotists are, are, are trained to support that blinking. So as the person blinks, just as you are right now, mm -hmm. hypnotists will say, this is a famous expression coined by hypnotist Milton Erickson, that's right. And basically what they're doing is they're encouraging the person to keep going into trance. That's right. Mm -hmm. You may feel more relaxed right now. Is that fair to say? Yeah, yeah. It is fair to say, yeah. So you are going into trance. And I would say light trance. You're not going necessarily going into a heavy trance. And um, because you would not want to go into heavy trance because you're currently running a podcast. Um, so blinking is this very interesting phenomenon within hypnosis that no one has explained. Why do people start blinking in a particular way when they go into trance? And I have an explanation. This is purely my theory. I don't know if it's true, but I also work in natural vision restoration. So natural vision restoration is the idea that you can restore the, your eyesight without glasses or contacts or laser surgery by simply exercising your eyes. And one of the common methods of eye exercise involves blinking. So when, what you do is you will look at something that's slightly out of focus and then you blink at it and you try to bring it into focus. So when I studied this method, I was like, What's going on here? It's as if we are, in a sense, we are. It's like our eyes are a little bit like a camera, and when we blink, we trigger the focusing mechanism, much like the way your phone works or mm -hmm. or a camera works. And so, I was intrigued by this and kind of like thinking, oh, it's like we have an out. We have a movie going right now, so we both have a movie where we're blinking and we're using our blinks to sort of like not only not only do people blink to bring things into focus? They blink in a way to respond to what they are hearing. So I'll give you an example. When you are skeptical about what something is, somebody is saying, you often blink multiple times. Like, well, what? Right? Yeah. yeah. Blinking is a key part of the way we respond to things visually. Mm -hmm. That's that's very interesting. Thanks. Thanks, Albert. Any word of caution that you have for our viewers on hypnosis? I think part of the problem is that because there's so much stereotyping, so I'll give you an example. Let, let, let's, let, let me give you an example of the perceived dangers versus the real dangers. That'll be great. Okay, so perceived danger would be like from movies like Get Out. Mm -hmm. Or there's another English film. I have a really funny story to tell you. There's a film yeah. called Tra Trance. It was a very popular film, probably made about 10 years ago with uh, Rosario Dawson. Mm -hmm. They made this terrible, atrocious film called Trance. In it, it, it's like a plot to rob the most valuable paintings in the world. And the way it's been is done is that many of the key people, like the people that are protecting the paintings, are are hypnotized. But they are hypnotized to forget they were hypnotized. Okay, so that is a lie. You cannot do that. So in the movie, so anybody seeing this movie would think, oh, my God, you can hypnotize people to forget they were hypnotized. Right. Why would that have implications? Because if somebody came to me as a client and I could hypnotize them that way, I could put them into trance. I could ask them to hand over a ton of money, you know, give me all your money. And then I would hypnotize them to forget that ever happened. Mm -hmm. I could send them on their way. Now. In the hypnotic trance, you remember at the beginning I said it's like a waking dream and yeah. dreams have their own sort of constituency or structure. So in the dream, yes, I can make you forget that you handed over the money. So in the dream, if I asked you, okay, uh, did I did you hand over all your money? You'd be like, no, mm -hmm. I don't remember doing that. But the minute that you wake up, mm -hmm. just like you would as you wake up out of a dream, you would suddenly go, wait a second. And then you would start remembering the elements of the hypnotic trance. Okay. You took all my money. My money. <laughs> and so, so the hypnotist cannot do this to you. Mm, okay. Cannot, cannot hypnotize. People remember everything eventually. 
there's there might be rare exceptions to this, but like I said, they are they are very rare. It, it does not usually happen. So so that's one of the things. Two, uh, in the film Get Out, which is a recent Hollywood hit, uh, first of all, the person was hypnotized against their will. So he would sit down and talk to this woman, and she would take a a uh, teacup. And she would put her spoon in the teacup and she would start rotating the teacup, mm -hmm. the spoon. It would make this sort of weird noise. Now, I would say, yes, that imagery is slightly hypnotic. Uh, would a normal person go into trance forcibly just looking at somebody putting, you know, circling a spoon around a teacup? No, you'd be like, what are you doing? Knock that off. <laughs> It's not not that that powerful that way. You have to agree. If I said to you, watch the spoon in the teacup, focus on the spoon in the teacup, you are allowing yourself to become more relaxed. Okay, now you're going into trance. I often joke if you if you're worried that somebody is hypnotizing you against your will, because a lot of people do worry about this, then there's a really interesting way to stop it. You just say, cancel that suggestion. So if somebody says, like, you will do as I tell you, you just say, cancel that suggestion. And in your mind, you can say it in your mind and mm -hmm. it won't happen. But but my point is that that cinema itself is far more hypnotizable or hypnotizing than hypnosis. Or it's the movie that is creating the hypnosis, not the hypnotist in the movie. So these are these false stereotypes. One, getting hypnotized against your will. Two, yeah. Being hypnotized by something as silly as a spoon going around in a cup when you don't want to when you're there going ah stop stop don't don't do that it, it, it wouldn't work yeah. three that you can be hypnotized for for maybe days or months or, or or years to forget that something happened no roughly the span of a hypnotic state is about two hours sometimes it can be extended so yeah for two hours yes you can create hypnotic amnesia but then the person wakes up and they remember everything. So all those things are false. They're all false. And um, hy hypnosis is safe otherwise. Now, what are the risks? You mentioned what are the risks? Yeah. There's some practical risks. So if somebody is sitting and they go into deep trance, like, for example, I always make, pe make sure people are in comfortable chairs that they're well supported. You don't hypnotize people on stools because they're sitting on a stool and they go into deep trance they can fall off the stool and hit their head that's a real risk yes there's a second factor if you're dealing with trauma and you're asking people to remember difficult traumas mm -hmm. there's some risk of re-traumatization so that's mm -hmm. a risk and and uh, an experienced hypnotist should know when and how to bring back or work with a trauma. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's where there is some risk. Uh, can you mess with people personally? I would just say it's same with any th other form of therapy. If your therapist wants to mess with you and is determined to do so, them being a hypnotist doesn't make that much difference, except that maybe you're lying there with your eyes closed. That's what makes you more vulnerable, not that that it's hypnosis um because again if the hypnotists are doing something unethical or improper while you're in trance generally you're gonna wake up and you're gonna you're gonna go i don't want to continue anymore mm -hmm. so yeah. that's so it's 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 self-regulating that way so trust is definitely a foundation for any kind of therapy but but hypnotherapy as well you have to uh, have the trust I'm actually really glad you said that because I have a saying, which I find is true, is that you only go as deep as you trust. Mm -hmm. If you went to a hypnotist who you just were uncertain about, you just did not trust them or felt that you were not on the same page, chances are you would not go into deep trance, right? Yeah, because sense. you only go as deep as you trust. Okay. Yeah. And any parting advice, uh, hypnotic advice for our audience? I would say, you know, um, to not be afraid of, I don't think, I'm not saying you have to, that you should, or you have to pursue hypnosis, but like I said, I mentioned, I remember, mentioned Sigmund Freud, and I forgot to mention this, is that uh, 
when Freud popularized the idea of the unconscious, he thought 50% of our thoughts were unconscious. Well, neuroscientists have actually measured it and it's closer to 97%. Like it's a lot. Now, part of this are just like instincts and, you know, hormones and things like that. But, but the reason for me saying that is that I think that hypnosis and trance work, because there's different ways of doing hypnosis, it's not all swinging pocket watch stuff, mm -hmm. gives us a way to access this mysterious part of ourselves for, for our own betterment. And we should stop being afraid of it. Hypnosis allows us to carefully and gently work through these things in sensible and healthy ways. Thank you so much, uh, Albert, for uncovering this mysterious topic of hypnosis and sharing with us the multiple healing benefits uh, that have been scientifically proven. I hope that this podcast brings about increased awareness in the field of hypnosis. And I'm glad that you didn't hypnotize me during our chat today. Well, thanks for those, <laughs> <laughs> thanks for those, uh, those, those mini experiments. They definitely were very interesting. Okay, I'm glad to hear that. Lovely, lovely having you, uh, Albert. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Really terrific questions. So was, we covered a lot of territory. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I hope this conversation with Albert has helped dispel some of the myths associated with hypnotherapy and also increased awareness of the healing benefits of hypnosis. So stay tuned and don't forget to subscribe to my channel for many such interesting conversations coming your way.